Well, hello, and welcome back to Principles of Accounting 2. I'm your host, Dr. B. Uh, today, we will be covering uh, process cost systems, and we'll be building on what we learned about in the previous week, which was job cost systems. Process cost systems are very similar to job cost systems. The difference is process cost systems is where we continuously manufacture without stopping. Whereas job cost systems, we learned last week that with job cost systems, we do things by the customer order or by the job. In process cost systems, it's continuous manufacturing. And before we jump into the content, before we jump into the content for the week, uh, I, I do a quick, quick housekeeping notes. Most of you have been very, very good about staying on top of those deadlines, and I sincerely appreciate that. As you know, this is a very busy course. We're only eight weeks. We cover two chapters per week. It's a lot of work. That means that there's two assignments in every single week. So it's very, very essential that you stay on top of your work. In fact, some of you have been so good to even work ahead, which is fantastic. And I sincerely appreciate that as well. So uh, as you progress through the course, please be reminded that there are two things to do in every single week. If you fall behind in this course, it becomes very difficult to get caught up. So uh, having said that, please make sure that you stay on top of your work. Be in the, be in, try to log into the classroom uh, through Blackboard regularly uh, and, and be checking those assignments. So we are in week two, believe that or not, uh, week two out of the eight weeks. So that is fantastic. That means we are rocking and rolling. This week, uh, we'll cover chapter 17 and 18. Chapter 17 is, uh, is on process-based uh, costing or uh, yeah, process systems costing. And chapter 18 is about activity-based costing. And uh, so chapter 17, we have a quiz due by the end of this week. And for chapter 18, we have a discussion board. So with discussion boards, I want to remind you that with discussion boards, each discussion board is worth 5% of your total grade. So having said that, it is super, super important that you participate in every discussion board. How do you earn the full five points in the discussion board? Through three total posts. One original post responding to the discussion question. Just like here, Alexa did a wonderful job. If you look, if you look at Alexa's post, she did a wonderful job. Uh, she's got a few paragraphs here, about 150 words roughly. She even has the reference. That is fantastic. This, Alexa did a wonderful job, and I would say that her post is a prime example of what I'm looking for. Now, Alexa's not done yet. She still has to do two more posts. Now, when the rest of you respond to the discussion question and you write your wonderful paragraphs with your, uh, with your examples, Alexa will then respond to two of you, right? Within another couple full paragraphs and her reference. So to recap, what you need to do for the discussion board is I'm looking for three total posts. One, original response, just like what Alexa has here to the discussion question, and she will then respond to two of her classmates. Questions? We're good? Okay. So that is exactly what I'm looking for in the discussion questions, and that will earn you the full five points. And of course, it needs to be on time, right? Uh, my recommendation to you is try to do your initial post by Thursday night. The reason why Thursday night for the discussion board is that will help you when it comes time to respond to your two classmates by Sunday night. See what I'm saying? All right. Great. So 
If you have any questions, comments, concerns, feel free to ask. Okay, I'm here to help. I'll get off my soapbox about the discussions, but just remember, every discussion board is worth 5% of your total grade. Very, very important that you participate in every single one of them to earn those full points. There, in this class, there are four total discussion boards to participate in. That means there are two full letter grades dedicated to discussion boards. So each discussion board being worth five points apiece, that's five, that's 10, that's 15, that's 20% of your total grade through discussion board. So please make sure that you're actively participating. Questions, comments, concerns? Good so far? Okay. Let's go ahead and jump to the content. <clears throat> so last week we discussed job-based costing systems. In a job-based cost system, we learned that the cost is associated with each customer job, each customer order, which is different than process cost systems. Today, we're going to learn about process cost systems. In a process cost system, we're looking at costing from a continuous process. When you hear continuous, think of a company that makes something continuously, regardless of the jobs. An example of a process cost company would be an oil refinery, because they're continually refining the oil, regardless of the customer orders. Another example would be a, a, Water paper, a paper mill, continuously processing. Go ahead, Alex. Do you have a question? I was going to say like a water company. Water company, Tony, yes, absolutely. A, a, a water company is another excellent example because it's continuous. And to go along those lines, Tony, if you think about a company like Coca-Cola or Pepsi, they both are continuous process companies. They both continuously make their products, regardless of customer orders. Another example would be an ice cream manufacturer. They continuously make ice cream, regardless of the customer orders. Oh, I a way that I said that it's mighty sweet. I'm sorry, what was that? Alex? Might be having some audio. Okay, so let's jump into it. <clears throat> In process manufacturing, the product process moves through departments. Okay. In process manufacturing, the product is identical. They make the same product continuously. So Tony gave the example of a water uh, processor, water company. They continuously bottle water. It's the same exact water. It comes from the same exact spring in the ground. The product is the exact same. And they use the same production process to manufacture those water bottles, to manufacture that water. And the product moves through departments until it becomes a finished good. So the way to think about it is in a, on an assembly line, on the left side at the very beginning of the assembly line, we have our raw materials. In Tony's example of a process, uh, a, a water manufacturer, we have the uh, the plastic to make the water bottles. Okay, the raw plastic. We have uh, the caps that go on the water bottles, and then of course we have the water itself. Those are all the raw materials. Okay, and so we bring it those into out of raw materials and into work in process. 
When it goes into work in process, that's when it starts with the first department. In our example, Department A. Department A, they, uh, and that's the department that shapes the water bottles out of the raw plastic. So they'll take the raw plastic material out of the raw materials, bring it into Department A, and they'll shape the water bottles, right, with a the machine. They'll mold them. And that's what, that's what Department A does. And then when the water bottles are molded, they'll move them to Department B. Department B will, um, they'll fill the water bottles, okay? Then they'll move it to Department C. Department C, they'll put the cap on the water bottles. And then they'll move it from Department C to Department D. And in Department D, they'll put the label on the bottles and then box them. And so at each department, we're adding cost to the process. In Department A, we have direct materials and direct labor and factory LRAP. In Department B, we have more direct materials, more direct labor, more factory LRAP. In Department C, more direct materials, more direct labor, more factory rent. And the same for Department D. And then after Department D, it becomes a finished good. And I'll show you exactly how that process works. So uh, in comparison to jobs, which we learned about in the last chapter, job order manufacturers they make similar products in batches and they sell them to customers. Typically the way it works is a customer order comes in, the manufacturer will, uh, they will manufacture the products based off the customer order and then ship it out. That's a job order, right? And we learned a lot about that in the previous chapter. In process manufacturing, it's continuous. It's not based on a job, it's, con it's a continuous process. And so there are uh, certain companies that we consider to be process manufacturers and certain companies we consider to be job order companies. So uh, looking at our uh, early example, Tony mentioned a water company and that fits, that fits the definition of a process manufacturer. It's continuous. For example, Pepsi and Coca-Cola are process manufacturing companies. They continuously make the soft drinks regardless of customer orders. Another example would be like a, a milk company, uh, an ice cream company, um, a, a other food processors like a, a chicken processor or a beef processor. They'll, that we call those processors because they continuously do that regardless of the customer orders. That's why every time you go to the grocery store, you see that those products are available. It's because they're continuously manufacturing those and getting them out to their customers regardless of their orders. Alcoa, they make many, uh, aluminum, Intel makes computer chips, Apple makes iPhones, and Hershey makes chocolate bars. They consider these companies to be process manufacturers because they continuously make their products regardless of any customer orders. And we compare that to companies that are what we consider to be job order companies. These are companies that produce their products based on the in individual customer jobs. An example would be Disney. Disney makes movies, well, in addition to the theme parks, but Disney makes movies. And movies are based off of the customer jobs. The individual film companies comes to Disney and says, I'd like you to create this for me. That's an individual job. An example, an, another example of a job order company would be Nike Shoes. Nike manufactures shoes, but they do it based off of the individual job orders. For example, uh, Foot Locker will approach Nike and say, hey, Nike, I, I'd like to order, you know, one million pairs of your shoes. And Nike would be great. They'll 
they'll make the, the shoes based off of that job and then ship it out to their customer. Richard, did you have a question? Uh, yes. Uh, so where would, uh, how would we categorize the drop shipping business model? Would that be continuous or? Shipping? Drop shipping. Is, is this business model where uh, the seller just oh, with the products? Yes, and, and once the uh, the customer orders a product online, then the manufacturer on the other side will uh, ship the, the product out. Excellent question. Yeah, drop shipping is a service, not a manufacturer. Oh, okay, so, got yeah, it. exactly. Good question. So, so yeah, it would be neither. It's because it's a that's a service, not not a manufacturing. Company. Oh, got it. Thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure. Good question. Uh. There's a story behind that. Richard, we'll, we'll have to talk one day because I, I, I was in the drop, drop shipping business for a little while myself uh, with a partner of mine. Interesting business. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Very cool. Uh, and, and you can see the other companies on this list. Those types of companies, they manufacture by the individual customer order. So when you think customer order, think job order company. When you think Continuous, that is a process manufacturer. Another example that's not on the list for a process manufacturer would be an oil company like ExxonMobil or um, uh, Chevron or you name it, Shell. They're all oil manufacturers, oil processors, and they process the oil, they refine it. So I got a question. Yes, go ahead, Charles. If uh, those are gas processors or oil processors, would people such as like Toyota, uh, Chevy, Jeep, would those be job order companies? That is a wonderful question. I'm so happy you asked that question, Charles. I would actually consider the auto manufacturers to be a process manufacturing company. The reason being is because they continuously manufacture new vehicles and deliver them to their in the, their individual dealerships regardless of their orders. There are some cases that might be job-based. For example, a Tesla would actually be considered a job order company because of the, their specialized manufacturing process. So it depends on the company, but that is a wonderful question, Charles. So uh, a process manufacturer, I would say, would be your Toyota, your Ford, Chevy, uh, the other GM products. Those are more process based. Job order based, I would say, would be Tesla um, and and maybe some of the other smaller manufacturers that are more specialized. Excellent question, Charles. It depends on their business model to, to, to answer the question. Very, very good. Uh, any other questions before we continue? Good, okay, very cool. Okay, so the, as you would expect, there are some similarities between process cost systems and job order cost systems. They both record and summarize products, allocate factory overhead, provide useful product information for decision making, classify costs based on direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. And they both use a perpetual inventory system for materials, work and process, and finished goods. As you remember, the word perpetual inventory, perpetual, is continuous. Perpetual is continuous. Think of um, when you go to Macy's and you buy that new shirt that you like so much, and you go to Macy's and you go to cash out to the register, they they go like this, beep, beep, with a, with a scanner, right? The scanner is a form of perpetual inventory system management it automatically takes it out of inventory the minute that that scanner hits the barcode. Yeah? And so that's why it's perpetual. perpetual. The 
other type of inventory system that we don't talk about as much, especially in this class that you learned about back in Principles of Accounting 1, is called the periodic inventory system. And that's where we do physical counts, and it's usually for specialized products. Okay, let's take a look at the physical flow uh, throughout the process cost system, and we will compare that to what we learned about in the job cost system from the previous chapter. First, let's take a look. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, I have a quick question. Yes, go ahead, Alex. Okay, so uh, just for clarity, you know, this is Alex. Uh, clarification purposes. Uh, so you mean like say when I go to the grocery store and I'm purchasing items, et cetera, et cetera. So every time, you know, I'm, I'm at the line and I'm purchasing my things and every time they scan my, that means this is that perpetual inventory. That's correct. Man, yep. that's, that is awesome. Exactly. Yep. That is called. <laughs> yep. And that's and so that, that. that's how the uh, grocery store tracks the inventory that they have available for sale. So as they sell the inventory to you, the customer, it, when they scan on that barcode, it takes it out of their inventory and it's no longer available for sale because you bought it. Now this may be this may be off off a little bit, but that that particular system that particular yeah. system that they're using mm -hmm. it's it's probably owned by someone else or they they're paying for that that system. No, they they they, they typically own that system. Uh, they they might have to pay for the software that they're using, but okay. but they but they own the barcodes and the scanners. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Excellent, excellent question. Appreciate yeah, it. My pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very good. Excellent questions. Uh, so looking at looking at the differences, if you remember back to what we talked about last week with job order cost systems, we take the direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead, and we apply those costs to the individual job cost sheets based off of the customer orders to create the finished good, right? That's how it works with job cost system. It's based off the individual customer jobs using the job cost sheet for direct materials, direct labor, and factory overhead. Okay, that we got it. We, we, we understand that. Looking at process cost systems, it's continuous, okay, continuous. And we don't base things off of job cost sheets because there it's a continuous process there is no job right it's it's a continuous process they they make and sell it regardless of customer orders so the way that it works is we take our direct materials and our direct labor and our factory overhead and we apply those costs to each process, each step of the process, each department, okay? It, within work and process, we have multiple departments, okay? Or multiple steps or stages, whatever you wanna call it. Think of it uh, this way. We take it out of raw materials, we put it into work and process. When it's in work and process, it moves from one stage to another. If you think about an assembly line, uh, if you think about an assembly line, it moves down, the product moves down the assembly line and it's being processed at each part of that assembly line. Uh, you brought up the example of a auto manufacturer. Here's, uh, Charles, here's a way to think about it. 
in an auto manufacturing facility, you have the car on an assembly line moving down the assembly line, right? And that each part of the work in process, something's being done to that car. So for example, the body, the frame of the car is coming down the assembly line. At the first step, we'll, we'll call it the, we'll call it the um, electrical department, okay? And the electrical department on the assembly line, they are putting the electrical parts onto the, the frame of the, of the car. Then after that's done, the car move, makes its way down the assembly line. And there's a lot of cars behind that one, right? There's multiple cars on the assembly line at any given time. And so that electrical department, they only do electrical, okay? So they're putting the same electronic components into each car along the process on the assembly line. The next department that the car makes it to after electrical is the engine department where they put they drop the engine down and they bolt it on to the the frame of the car okay and then they connect the electrical and then it and then they moves the car moves down to the next department where we'll call it the um the assembly process where they're putting the doors on they're putting the trunk and the hood on okay and then it moves further down to painting, and it moves further down to whatever, and then it's done. Okay, then it rolls off the assembly line on to, into the parking lot. That's an assembly line. Okay, uh, and, and auto manufacturers, they do an excellent job at, at, with assembly lines. They're, 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 the end, they're the pioneers when it comes to assembly. There is a process cost system. What happens at each stage or each department is we're continually adding cost. Okay. So we started with direct materials. We brought it into the first part, which is work in process. And within the work in process, we have the multiple departments that we just talked about in the example of the car moving down the assembly line. Now, if you think about that, in each of those departments, we have direct labor and we have factory overhead. And we add those costs in addition to the direct materials that we're processing. And then once those are added up and the car leaves that, uh, that department onto the next one, we do the same thing again. We add more direct labor, we add more factory overhead, and we keep and more direct materials and then it keeps going until it until it's done. <clears throat> That's a process cost system. So looking at our example of an ice cream manufacturer, we start with our raw materials. That's our dairy, our milk, cream, sugar, okay? Those are our raw materials. We take it out of raw materials and put it into the mixing department. That's the first department that we hit, the big mixing bowl, right? And so it moves down the assembly process into the mixing bowl. <clears throat> the mixing department mixes those ingredients together, okay? So we took our direct materials, we were adding in direct labor, that's the people mixing it together, and we're also adding in factory overhead. Now remember, Factory overhead includes things like utilities, depreciation for the equipment, supervisor salaries, all that extra fun stuff, right? <laughs> so we're adding a little bit of that into the mixing department. Then when the mixture is done, it moves down the line to the packaging department. Packaging department is still work in process. Now, what happens in the packaging department is the ice cream uh, drops into the, pack, the, the containers, the packages, and then somebody uh, is there and they're, they're sealing it and they're, they're closing the boxes 
and then they move it to the finished goods. Now, in the packaging department, we're adding more direct materials, which is the packaging, right? We're adding direct labor. Those are the people doing the packaging. And we're adding more factory overhead, depreciation for the equipment, uh, supervisor salary, utilities, that type of stuff. And then once that's all done, it becomes a finished good. But you see the process. It goes from the mixing department, we've added all the costs up in that mixing department, and we shift all those costs with the product to the packaging department, and then we add more costs in the packaging department. And then once it's all done, we add it all up, and that is the cost of the finished good. Does it make sense? Does that process make sense? Yeah. yeah. Any questions on that process, or did I do an okay job explaining it? I understood. Great. Fantastic. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. Thanks, Alex. Okay. <clears throat> so, remember, the primary difference between the job order cost system is that the job order cost system, we accumulate the cost by the job cost sheets. In the process cost system, we accumulate the cost at each department. Okay, that's the difference between the two. So looking at the physical flow, we take it from raw materials, we put it into work in process. The first department within work in process is mixing. Once it's all mixed up, we move it from mixing department over to the packaging department. And once the packaging department's done doing their thing, we move it out of packaging department and into finished goods. And at each department, we're adding direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. And, and then once that's done, it moves over to the next department. We add more direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. And then once it's done there, it becomes finished goods. So here is a, uh, a relatively confusing chart <laughs> that I, I want to show you to help you to kind of understand the flow, the physical flow. Okay. So we have our materials. We take our direct materials and we move it into the first department within work in process, which is the mixing department. It, within mixing department, we add We've already added the direct materials, then we add uh, direct labor and factory overhead. Okay? And from there, we move all of those costs over to the packaging department, and we add more direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. But there's this new cost that you see. It's called the cost of units transferred in. Cost of units transferred in. What that is, the cost of units transferred in, is the cost of the units completed in the mixing department that have been transferred into the packaging department. Okay. So the direct materials that you see in the packaging department, those are the direct, those are the boxes. Okay, those, that's not the ice cream mixture, that's the boxes that you see at letter B under work in process for the packaging department. The direct materials for work in process in the mixing department, that's the ice cream, yeah? So we add B, C, and E together from the mixing department, and that becomes letter F in the packaging department. Make sense? Mostly? I know this, this slide makes it a little bit more confusing, but I'm just trying to show you the flow. Okay, and then, and then we add B, F, C, and E together in the packaging department, and that becomes letter G in finished goods. That's the total cost of the finished product, letter G. And then when we sell the finished goods to our customers, it becomes cost of goods sold. 
but you already know that. Okay, good. Okay. Now, as we are learning about uh, the uh, managerial accounting concepts, you are learning that we produce a lot of internal reports. And these reports are used by management to make decisions. And one of those reports is called the cost of production report. This report helps management to deter determine how costs are being allocated to the product as it moves through the work and process stage. Okay. The cost of production report applies cost to partially completed units. So think of it this way. At the end of the month, I'm still going to have some materials left in work and process. We know that, right? Because remember, it's a continuous process. Process costing is continuous. It does never stop. Okay? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're making ice cream. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're bottling water. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're, we're processing chicken and beef. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're, we're producing other grocery items. Okay, it's continuous. It's a process costing system. So because of that, at the end of the month, I'm going to have what we call partially completed units in each department. What does that mean? That means that in the mixing department, I'm going to have ice cream sitting in that in the mixing bowl. At the end of the month, I'm still going to have ice cream that's being packaged. Those aren't completed units. They're not done yet. They're not available for sale yet. They're still in the work in process. So in accounting, we need to understand that we are allocating cost at each department within work and process. And in order to identify what those costs are, we use this thing called the cost of production report, where we identify the amount of raw materials, direct labor, and factory overhead allocated at each department. And then we also recognize the number of units that have been transferred out from one department to another. So this is the process that we use to create the cost of production report. The first step is to determine the number of units to be assigned cost. So one way to look at that is, well, I, uh, I plan to produce 5,000 batches of ice cream this month. Okay. So of the 5,000 batches of ice cream, that means I need to allocate 5,000. I, I, I plan to create 5,000 units, so I need to assign cost to 5,000 units. The second step is to compute the equivalent units of production. One unit is a completed ice cream, okay? Equivalent units might be a fourth, a half, three fourths, right? That, that we call as equivalent units. Equivalent. The third step is to determine the cost per equivalent unit. And then the fourth step is to allocate cost to units transferred out of partially and partially completed units. I know it sounds like a lot, but we'll get there, I promise. <clears throat> in order to help us in preparing this report, based off of those steps, we use what we call cost flow assumptions. And to identify the flow of the uh, inventory, in our stages, we use in process manufacturing the first in, first out method. 
Oh, you probably remember this from accounting 201, principles of accounting one. The first in, first out inventory method, as you remember, means that the first part of the inventory coming in is the first one to be sold or to move out, right? First in, first out. The first in, first out method helps a process manufacturer to follow the physical flow of the inventory, okay? First in, first out method is the most commonly used method for products that have expiration dates or, pro or, or uh, inventory that uses the continuous process method because in most cases, they are the first uh, products to leave the, the warehouse. So let's take a look at our ice cream example using the first in, first out method. In the month of July, uh, I, ha have, um, I have inventory in process at the beginning of July. At the very beginning of the month, I already have stuff sitting in my work in process, right? Because remember, it's a continuous process. So at the beginning of the month, I have direct materials of 5,000 gallons of ice cream at a dollar per gallon. So that's 5,000. I, I have conversion costs at 70%. Okay, you're, I can hear you now. Dr. B, what is a conversion cost? Okay. When we are converting something, that means that we are moving it from one department to another. So, for example, in my mixing department, which is what we're focusing on with this report in front of us, looking at the mixing department for our company for the month of July. In our mixing department, what the conversion cost means, this is the amount of gallons that I have finished or converted from raw materials to a batch of ice cream. I've converted it from raw materials to a batch of ice cream. Those are conversion costs. I converted it from raw materials to a batch of ice cream. Okay, so that's conversion cost. I've converted during the month of uh, at the beginning of the month of July, seventy percent of my five thousand gallons that I started the month with. So the way that it works is we take our raw materials, or um, yeah, our raw materials at the beginning of the month plus our conversion costs. I converted 70%, I completed 70%. So to find your conversion costs, you take the gallons times the conversion percentage, also known as the percentage that you've completed. So 5,000 times 70% is 1,225. So I take my 5,000 gallons, or my five, I'm sorry, my $5,000 of direct materials plus my $1,225 worth of conversion costs equals a beginning inventory in process uh, for inventory, 6,225. Okay, so that's your beginning inventory that's in, in process, work in process inventory. Okay, and this is in the mixing department. This doesn't include what's happening in packaging. Okay, so at the beginning of July, I got 6,225 in work in process inventory in the mixing department. Then during the month of July, I uh, 
purchased an additional 60,000 gallons of materials to be used in the mixing department during the month of July. And the cost of that purchase for the, the uh, raw materials for the month of July was $66,000. Also during the month of July, I incurred a direct labor cost of $10,000. And I incurred a cost for factory overhead of 7275 so we add our direct materials cost plus our direct labor cost plus our factory overhead cost plus our beginning inventory equals our total production cost. Good so far? No, this sometimes looks a little bit confusing. Good so far? Yeah? Okay. This, this is an example, of course, of the cost of production report. So by preparing this report, we uh, the cost of the gallons transferred to the packaging department in the month of July and the ending work and process inventory in the mixing department are determined. This helps me to determine how much was transferred to the packaging department during the month of July. And how much is left at the end of the month sitting in the mixing department. So that leads us to how do we assign costs to the units? We had said earlier that we look at a whole unit as being a completed unit. There are other methods of determining a completed unit, but how do we allocate the cost to each respective unit, whether it be a partially completed unit or a whole unit? The first step to this process is to determine the type of units that you're using. In our example, we're using gallons. But a unit of measure is identified as a ton, a gallon, pounds, barrels, cases, which goes on, right? But in our example, we're using gallons. So first step is identify that we're using the unit of measure, which is gallons. So step one, gallons. And we apply that concept. So, at the beginning of the month of July, in my work in process in the mixing department, I started the month with 5,000 gallons. I received an additional 60,000 gallons from the uh, raw materials storage. So, for the month of July, I have a total of 65,000 gallons that I have in my mixing department. So also in step one, what we do is we assign costs according to groups. Group one, we have work in process at the beginning of the month, that's 5,000 gallons, according to our example. In group two, we assign costs to the started and completed units during the month of July, 60,000 gallons. In group three, we identify the units and ending work in process inventory on July 31st. So I started the uh, beginning of the month with 5,000 gallons. I started the month of July with 60,000 gallons. I 
uh, completed at the end of the month 57,000 gallons, which leaves me an ending inventory balance of 3,000. How that happened? Well, we brought in 60,000 gallons. I completed 57, so that gives me a difference of 3. 60 minus 57 is 3. If we look at the total of gallons that needs to be assigned cost, it's 65,000 gallons. Well, how do we know that? We started the month with 5,000, so we have to assign cost to that first 5,000. And then we brought in another 60,000 during the month of July. So there's another 60, 5 plus 60 is 65. So how do we assign the cost to the 65,000 gallons based off of groups? Group one, beginning of the month, what do we start with? 5,000 gallons. Group two, started and completed month of July, 57,000 gallons. I transferred out to the packaging department 62,000 gallons. That's, that's how much I com started and completed, plus the beginning inventory, out to the uh, packaging department, and I was left with 3,000 gallons at the end of the month. So I need to assign costs for a total of 65,000 gallons for the mixing department. So that completes step one, okay, of assigning costs. Step two, we said, so we need to identify the equivalent units of production. So how do we do that? We look at the whole number of units. So looking at this, we can identify the total number of units which are whole units, right? And we can identify the units that we've completed and the units that are still in work in process for that department across time. So looking at our example, let's assume that we have a, a, a thousand gallon vat or batch of ice cream that is 40% complete in the mixing department at the end of May. This means that 40% that is complete uh, is conversion costs. Conversion costs, as you know, are the costs that we assign to gallons that are completed and are being moved to the next department. Those are conversion costs. So if I completed 40% of a thousand gallons, that means I completed 400 gallons. My equivalent units is a thousand gallons. A thousand is the total number of gallons. So the way to think about the equivalent units is, or the whole units, I should say, the whole unit is a thousand gallons. Those are the total number of gallons available. I finished 40%. So 1,000 units materials cost is the same, 1,000 units. For conversion cost, I completed 40% of 1,000 gallons. So therefore, my equivalent units for the conversion cost is 400 gallons. How did we get 400? We took 1,000 gallons times the completed percentage, 40%. 1,000 times 40% is 400. The equivalent units of materials and conversion costs are determined separately, okay? The reason why we do it separately is because uh, the rates are different for direct materials and factory overhead. So let's take a look. We figured out what our whole units are from the from the first step. Group one started 5,000 units, beginning of inventory for the month of July. Okay. 
group two, we started and completed 57,000 uh, full units. We added in 60,000 units, remember? So that gets us 100% of materials added in the month of July. Why is that? Because we didn't add any at the beginning of the month, but during the month, we added the 60,000 gallons. 62 minus 5,000 is 57,000, so group two. So we transferred out to the packaging department 62,000 gallons. How do we do that? Well, we started the month with 5,000. We uh, brought in 60 additional, 62 minus the 5, 57,000 is what we completed during the month of July, 62,000. Group three, we ended the uh, month of July with 3,000 units. So we need to apply costs of a total of 65,000 units. For units of direct materials, these are the total units that we uh, utilized during the month of July for direct materials. We brought in 57,000 units plus ending inventory of 3,000 gets us to that 60. That's how we got the 60. So looking at uh, it, this over time, we see that we started the month group one, 5,000 units. We allocated 100%. Group two, we utilized, we brought in another 60,000 uh, gallons. We started and completed 57,000 leaving us with an ending inventory of 3,000. These are where the conversion costs come in. So to complete out step two, the co computing the equivalent units. So we had earlier said that a whole unit is represented by the total available units. In our example, the uh, would be the 57,000 uh, gallons in the vat. And so we can we converted 30% at the beginning of the month. How we got 30%? Well, remember we started we started with 70% completed. So we completed the rest of that, which is 30%. So you take your whole units times your percent conversion equals your unit equivalent units for conversion. So the formula there is whole units times the percent conversion equals the equivalent units for conversion. And you just add those up. And that's the, what the uh, what this group, what this chart shows us. Good so far? Yeah, I know it's a lot to take in. <laughs> Processing. <laughs> okay, step three in the process is to determine the cost per equivalent unit. <clears throat> the cost per equivalent unit needs to be calculated for, of course, direct materials, direct labor, factory overhead. So the first thing we do is we calculate the cost for equivalent unit for direct materials. To do that, we take the total direct materials cost for the accounting period divided by the total equivalent units of direct materials. It's a very straightforward formula. Good news is that information will be provided to you. So you don't have to go, you know, trying to find it. It's just a matter of trying to remember the formulas. The conversion cost for, for equivalent unit, we take the total conversion cost for the period divided by the total equivalent units of conversion cost. <clears throat> so, uh, as we said earlier, group one, direct materials zero, group two, direct materials 57,000, 
the transfer output to 7,000 units to the packaging department in the month of July. Uh, and we left the end of the month of July with 3,000 units, assigning a total number of units of 60,000. The conversion cost is 59,250. How did we get that? You might be asking. In group one, at the beginning of July, we had finished 70% of the total gallons, leaving us with a conversion cost of 1,500. In group two, we com started and completed 57,000 units. So that's 57,000, which means we transferred out to the packaging department and conversion cost 58,500. In group three, out of the 3,000 units at the end, ending inventory, we completed 30%. That's 750. So you take your uh, transferred out plus the ending inventory that we finished, gives you the total gallons to be assigned cost for conversion units, 59,250. Now, what about the direct materials and direct labor? Of course, we got to add those in because, as you know, direct materials and direct labor are also part of conversion costs. So, for example, when we go from the mixing department to the packaging department, in each department, we're adding additional direct labor and direct uh, and in factory overhead in addition to the materials that we've already converted. So if you think about it from that perspective, we need to convert direct labor and factory overhead as well. We just learned how to do it for materials. We've got to do the same process for direct labor and factory overhead. The way that that works is for direct labor, it's the same. It's the, the amount of hours that we used in that process times the hourly rate, that cost simply gets transferred over. For factory overhead, it works the same way. That cost gets transferred over to the next department. That's why we call them conversion costs. So in our example, we use $10,500 for labor, $7,275 for factory overhead during the month of July. So uh, that gives us a total of 17775 we take our direct materials for the month of July, which was 66,000, plus the conversion costs for direct labor factory overhead, 17,775, gives us a total product cost for the month of July of 83,775. So to find the direct materials cost per equivalent unit, we take the total direct materials cost per equivalent, I'm sorry, we take the total direct materials cost for the period divided by the total equivalent units of direct materials. So in this example, $66,000 of direct materials cost divided by 60,000 equivalent units gets us to $1.10 per gallon of ice cream. Then, of course, we need to find the conversion cost per equivalent unit. To do that, we take the total conversion cost for the period, in our example, 17,775, that's the direct labor factory overhead, divided by the total equivalent units of conversion, which is 59,250, to get us to 30 cents per gallon of conversion cost. Now, of course, we end up adding the two together, $1.10 plus the 30 cents, giving us $1.40, which equals the total cost per gallon. Of course, the last step, 
is we allocate the cost uh, to the units transferred out in partially completed units. So let's take a look at what that looks like. <clears throat> so our example for the month of July, we incurred $90,000 uh, of cost that we need to account for. Started the month uh, with 5,000 gallons. We out of that amount, we completed 70,000 from the month before. So it's 1,225 that we completed. So we started the month with 6,225 in inventory. We brought in another 60,000 gallons at $66,000. We incurred 10,500 in labor and we incurred 7,275 in factory overhead, telling us that we incurred a total of 83,775 in cost for the month of July. We need to account for 90,000 uh, for total production costs. And of course, the, uh, as you know, what we do is we assign groups so group one is beginning inventory, 5,000. Group two are started and completed amount, 57,000. Group, and then we, of course, we transferred out to the packaging department, 62,000, leaving us with ending inventory of 3,000. Total whole units of 65,000, giving us a total cost of 90,000. And of course, what do we do? We take our equivalent units of reduction and we multiply that by the cost per equivalent unit to get our cost of inventory and process at the beginning of the month. So the, for the month of July, we started with 6,025 of conversion costs plus $450 at the beginning of the, of the month, giving us a total inventory transfer to the packaging department for, at the beginning of July of $6,675. So basically all this shows is that we added in those conversion costs at the end of the month. Okay. We start, uh, we processed, as you know, throughout the month of June, the 57,000 gallons. We, pro we, sent, we transferred that 57,000 gallons to the packaging department. And so we take our cost per equivalent unit of $1.10, multiply that by the 57,000 gallons that we transferred out, we get 62,700 uh, started and completed in the month of July. And of course, we take our conversion costs, 57,000 gallons that we started and completed, times 30 cents per equivalent unit, gets us an additional 17,100 of conversion costs. You add your direct materials cost plus your conversion cost to get your total cost of production for the month of 79,800. And we start the next month, July, uh, beginning in process inventory, 6,675 plus what we completed in month, month of July, 79,800, giving us a total cost transferred to the packaging department in the month of July of 86,475. I know it's fun, right? So gallons times conversion cost equals the cost in process. Let me just add across. And this slide helps us to summarize whole units uh, in comparison to the total cost. So as we prepare the, the cost production report, it helps management to summarize uh, the process at periodic intervals, 
uh, helps management to identify uh, the departments that are accountable for, uh, for the total number of units. And it helps management to identify the allocation of the costs that have been completed and transferred, partially completed units. And here is a summary of the, of the entire report. We can see how the convergent costs are added into the total cost at the end of the process for each department. And as you would expect, there are journal entries that uh, that we need to make at the end of the month. These are the adjusting journal entries to represent the transfer of the of the inventory from one one department to another within work in process. So at the very beginning, uh, we have our our raw materials department, where our milk, sugar, packaging, uh, you know, all of our raw materials are. We purchased eighty-eight thousand uh, dollars for the month. So we debit our materials uh, inventory 88,000 and we credit accounts payable 88,000. We transferred $66,000 of uh, raw materials to our mixing department. We transferred an additional $8,000 of raw materials to our packaging department. The, you know, boxes and lids and stuff like that. And to and so what we do is our journal entry is we debit work in process for the mixing department sixty six thousand. We debit work in process for the packaging department eight thousand. And, and then of course we have to uh, allocate our factory overhead for each department. So we debit factory overhead for the mixing department, debit factory overhead for the packaging department, and we credit our raw materials account. That represents the transfer from raw materials to work in process and the allocation of the factory overhead. And as we incur labor, we debit each respective work and process department and credit wages payable. And as we incur the additional factory overhead, we debit each factory overhead account for each department and we credit wages payable. And as we are applying it, we debit the work in process for each department and we credit factory overhead each department. Now when we're ready to transfer it from the mixing department to the packaging department, we debit work in process packaging and credit work in process mixing. So you the physical flow, right? And as we transfer it from the packaging department to finished goods, we debit finished goods and credit work and process packaging. And then, of course, when we sell it to our customer, we debit cost of goods sold and credit finished goods. And then this slide shows us the physical flow. It's fun stuff, right? <laughs> and then this is the uh, final journal, journal entry for the process cost system. Or, I'm sorry, the final inventory on the balance sheet for the working process system. And as you as you recall, on the balance sheet under inventory, we have raw materials, work in process, and finished goods. Now, since we're talking about a process cost system, you'll have more than one work in process inventory. And uh, in summary, what this does is this information helps management to make decisions. So looking at our mixing department, direct materials, we started with 5,000 gallons. We finished 70% of that initial 5,000 gallons at the, at the uh, end of the previous month. 
which got us to 1,225. We add that to the beginning balance to get 6,225 for the beginning work in process. That information helps management to identify the conversion cost per equivalent unit at the beginning of the month. And so what we do is we take the total, the total direct materials cost for the month divided by the equivalent units of production. So 5,000 uh, beginning balance divided by the 5,000 gallons is a dollar per gallon. Conversion costs of that, we take the conversion costs uh, of the units uh, uh, of 1,225, the same amount that we finished, uh, which was the, the, the 70%, divided by the uh, total equivalent units for, of conversion. To find that, we take the 5,000 units times the 70% that we can, that we completed, gets you to 35 cents per gallon. I think it's just a matter of following the same process. And then what this uh, tells us is how much that increase or decrease by to each respective month. Because remember, in management, we need to identify trends, right? Especially when it comes to costing. And this is a, a summary of, um, of that, what that report looks like in comparison to from month to month. And this information helps us to identify changes from month to month. And the last part of this topic is called yield. Yield tells us how well we are utilizing our materials. Okay, how well we're utilizing our materials. It's yield. We, to find the yield, we take the quantity of the material input divided by the quantity of the material input. I'm oh, sorry. Quantity of the material output divided by input. Output divided by input. It gives us yield. So if I, if I put into the department 9, 980 pounds of something, and I, I'm sorry, I completed 980 pounds, I put in 1,000 pounds, that gives me a yield of 98%. And that is the completion of Pro, uh, process cost systems. Any questions on process cost systems before we move into activity-based costing? We'll take a five-minute break as well. Yeah? Any questions? We're good? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording. Uh, we'll come back in five minutes, so let's, let's come back at... Uh, uh, 1226, and we'll uh, start activity-based costing. So give yourself a five-minute break, okay? Thank you so much.